it is almost always necessary for your microcontroller to communicate with the outside world. For example, it might need to send and receive commands and or data from a user, or it might need to receive data from sensors, do some computations based on that data, and then send commands to actuators. All of these scenarios require well-defined rules for sending and receiving information. These rules constitute communication protocols. One relatively simple and versatile communication protocol is called asynchronous serial communication. It is typically implemented using a piece of hardware called a UART. In this video, we'll first briefly define what a UART is. Then, we'll examine a typical asynchronous serial communication between a microcontroller and a laptop. Finally, we'll study in detail how to use a UART on the PIC32 microcontroller. UART is an acronym for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Let's break that down. The U in UART stands for Universal, and it means that the data format and transmission speed are configurable. As a result of this flexibility, and some other factors we'll get to shortly, UARTs are ubiquitous. For a long time, PCs used UARTs to communicate with various devices, such as printers, modems, and other common peripherals, including microcontrollers. More recently, as USB became popular, UARTs became less common on PCs. However, their popularity and ease of use spawned a family of devices that can emulate UARTs over USB, including the FTDI chip that your NU32 dev board uses to communicate with your laptop. Besides PC to device communication, UARTs are still used in many embedded systems, where a microcontroller might use a UART to talk to various sensors, actuators, or even to other microcontrollers. Next, the A in UART stands for asynchronous. This means that two devices communicating via UART do not share a clock signal. This cuts down on the number of PCB traces or wires between the two devices, but it also requires both devices to use the same UART settings. Finally, the R and the T in UART stand for receiver and transmitter, respectively. The transmitter's output is often labeled TX, and the receiver's input is often labeled RX. Because a UART contains both a receiver and a transmitter, it can be used for something called full duplex communication, where two devices simultaneously send and receive data. Now we'll step through a typical UART transmission. In this example, my NU32 is running the Talking PIC program, which uses one of the PIC's UARTs to echo user input. On my Windows laptop, I'm using PuTTY as a terminal emulator. If you're on Mac or Linux, you can use Screen. I'll be transmitting the letters NU32 in ASCII to the PIC. I have my serial port configured at 230,400 baud, using a pretty common message structure called 8N1. This means that each message contains 8 data bits, no parity bit, which is something used to check data integrity, and one stop bit, which is used to indicate when the message is complete. The data is sent out in binary form, and so that I know what to expect when I look at the transmit and receive lines, I pulled up the ASCII table to convert characters to binary. The talking pick program on the NU32 doesn't echo my text until I press enter, which often actually sends two characters, a carriage return, denoted by a backslash R, and a line feed or new line, denoted by a backslash N. To monitor the transmit and receive lines going into the NU32, I'm using a Salie logic analyzer connected to pins G6 through G9 and to ground. Instead of a logic analyzer, you could use an oscilloscope, such as your N-scope, but you'd probably have to slow down the baud rate quite a bit. Logic analyzers are designed specifically for monitoring digital signals, so they can handle faster data rates. Plus, Salie provides a free version of their software, and that's what I'll be using here. Here, you can see my PuTTY window and the Salie Logic Analyzer window. Each of the five little blips on channel 2 corresponds to one of my keystrokes, where I hit N, U, 3, 2, and then the Enter key. Right after I hit Enter, the pick responded, and that's shown on channel 4. Zooming way in on channel 2, we can see how the lowercase n was sent to the pick. The first thing to notice is that the least significant bit is sent first. In this case, that's a zero, followed by three ones, and so on until the most significant bit is sent, which in this case is also a zero. Moving on to the next character, we can see that the TX line idles high. For the NU32, this means that it sits at 3.3 volts when not in use. Some other microcontrollers might use 5 volts instead of 3.3 volts, 
and this is something you have to watch out for, and include a level shifter if two devices use different voltages. The next thing to notice is that when a transmission begins, the TX line is driven low for one baud period before the data bits are sent. This is standard behavior for UARCs, and it allows the receiver to know when to expect a new transmission. When the data bits have all been sent, the sender drives the TX line high for one baud period. This corresponds to the 1 in our 8N1 configuration, and it lets the receiver know the transmission is complete. If we were using a parity bit, we'd send the data bits and then the parity bit before sending the stop bit. Interestingly, it looks like PuTTY omits the new line character when I hit enter. This is PuTTY's default behavior, and like most terminal emulators, PuTTY allows you to change this. It doesn't really matter though, because the talking pick program looks for either the carriage return character or the new line character. As soon as I hit enter, the pick responds. Compared to my slow typing speed, the pick is quite fast, and it wastes no time between sending each character. The pick also sends each character the least significant bit first. Finally, because it's our own program, we get to control every character that is sent, including the new line character at the end of the message. Now that we have a high level understanding of what a UART is and what it looks like when we use it, let's dig into the details of how to use it. Like many other peripherals on the PIC, this breaks down into two questions. How do you set it up? And how do you read from it and write to it? And like most things on the PIC, you use special function registers to set it up. The first of these is the UX mode register. I'll summarize it before we delve deeper. The X is a placeholder for the number of the UART you're working with. Our PIC has six UARTs, so X can be a number from one to six. The UX mode register allows you to enable and disable UART X. You can also specify the flow control method through the mode register. Flow control is a kind of hardware handshaking process. It allows two UARTs to communicate faster than otherwise possible, but it takes a couple additional wires or PCB traces. Not all of the UARTs on the PIC have this, so this feature isn't implemented in every UX mode register. The mode register also allows you to configure parity if you want to use it, as well as specify the number of data bits and the number of stop bits. Now let's dive in, using the datasheet for reference. First, to enable or disable the UART, you can set or clear the 15th bit of the mode register, or equivalently, you can set or clear uxmodebits.on. To configure flow control, you can set or clear the 8th and 9th bits of the mode register, or you can set or clear uxmodebits.uen. The datasheet and our textbook both go into greater detail here, so refer to them for guidance regarding flow control. One step of the process for determining your UART's communication speed is setting the baud rate divisor, which you do through the third bit of the mode register, or equivalently through uxmodebits.brgh. We'll see an example of this soon. To set the parity and number of data bits, you can set or clear the first and second bits of the mode register, or equivalently you can write to uxmodebits.pdcell. Finally, to set the number of stop bits, you can set or clear the zeroth bit of the mode register, or equivalently you can set or clear uxmodebits.st cell. The second SFR relevant to configuring a UART on the PIC is the uxsta register, which contains the status of UART X. Again, we'll refer to the datasheet as we step through the contents of this register. First, the urxen bit, which is the 12th bit of the status register, is used to enable the receive pin. Likewise, the utxen bit, which is the 10th bit of the status register, is used to enable the transmit pin. There are a couple bits in the status register that aren't relevant to setup but are relevant to reading and writing. Since we're studying the status register, we'll take a glance at them now anyway. Internally, the UART transmitter queues data for transmission using a first-in, first-out buffer called a FIFO. Before we send data to the transmitter, we need to make sure the buffer is not full, and we do this by reading from the UTXBF bit, which is the ninth bit of the status register. Likewise, the UART receiver queues received data in its own FIFO, and before reading, we need to see if the receiver has data available. We do this by reading from the URXDA bit, which is the zeroth bit of the status register. The third SFR relevant to configuring a UART on the PIC is the UXBRG register, which sets up a piece of hardware called the baud rate generator. 
the baud rate generator takes as input the peripheral bus clock and outputs a clock signal whose frequency is some fraction of the peripheral bus clock frequency. The value you load into the BRG register can be computed using this equation. It depends on B, the desired baud, the frequency of the peripheral bus clock, and M, a divider whose value is specified in the mode register, as we discussed moments ago. Finally, now that we've waded through the PIC documentation and know which SFRs are relevant to working with a UART, let's see how it's really done. We'll dissect some of the code in the NU32 library, beginning with the NU32 startup function. I'll highlight the relevant lines of code as we go through it. First, we configure UART3 to operate at the desired baud. We do this by manipulating the baud rate divisor bit in the mode register and by loading the appropriate value into the BRG register. Notice that there's no need to do this math by hand. Instead, we can get the preprocessor to do it for us using a couple of pound defines. This ensures that the UART will operate at 230.4 kilobaud. Next, we configure the UART for 8N1 operation by writing to the appropriate bits of the mode register. We then enable the TX and RX pins. This pick allows us to use hardware flow control on UART3, so we specify the hardware flow control mode by writing to the mode register. Again, you can refer to the datasheet or the textbook for more information on hardware flow control. Finally, we enable UART3. You should always do this last. Now that we know how to set up the UART, let's see how we write to it and read from it. Both write and read operations follow the same basic workflow. First, we check if the appropriate buffer is ready by reading from the status register. Then, we either write to the transmit register or read from the receive register. The function for writing to the UART is a bit simpler than the function for reading, so let's look at the write function first. Again, I'll break it down and highlight the relevant code at each step. This function takes as input a pointer to an array of characters, or in other words, a string, passed by reference. Here, the variable string points to the first character in the array. In C, strings are null terminated character arrays, so this function loops until it reaches a null character. Each time through the loop, the function first waits until the transmit buffer is not full. Then, the function simply loads the current character into the transmit register. Lastly, the function increments the variable string so it points to the next character in the array. Once the null character is reached, the while loop terminates and the function returns. The function for reading from the UART looks a bit more complicated, but that extra complexity has little to do with the UART itself. This function takes two input arguments. First, a variable message, which is a pointer to an array of characters. Second, it takes an integer, max length, which tells the function how many elements are in the message array. This is a blocking function for reading strings. This means the function won't return until it has read an entire string. How does the function know when the entire string has been read? It simply stops reading once it sees a new line character or a carriage return character. This function uses a local variable named complete as a flag to indicate when the read operation is complete. As long as complete is false, the function will read from the UART receiver. As with the write function, the read function first checks to see if the UART is ready, and it does this by reading from the URXDA bit in the status register. If data is available, this function copies the contents of the receive register to a local variable named data. This corresponds to an individual character. If the received character is a new line or carriage return, the complete flag is set to true, causing the while loop to terminate and the function to return. If the received character is anything other than a new line or carriage return, the function copies the character to the message array in the place specified by the local variable numbytes. The function then increments numbytes to get ready to copy the next received character. If more than max length characters have been received, the function simply overwrites the oldest characters. The very last step is to make the last character in the array a null character so that the character array behaves like a string. Once this has been done, the function returns. Let's recap what we just learned in this video. We learned that UART stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, and that UARTs are quite useful for asynchronous serial communication between two devices, whether those are computers, microcontrollers, sensors, or actuators. 
We used the NU32 and a logic analyzer to look at a typical example of asynchronous serial communication between a computer and a microcontroller. This allowed us to see things like endianness, start bits, and stop bits. We then dug into the datasheet for the PIC32 and learned which SFRs are relevant to configuring and using a UART. Finally, we stepped through some example code in the NU32 library to understand how to configure a UART, how to write to it, and how to read from it. Once you are comfortable with these concepts and techniques, you'll be able to write microcontroller programs that interface with a variety of devices.